The title of my message is Don't Take the Bait. Everybody say, Don't Take the Bait. Don't Take the Bait. Amen. And so let's stand on our feet and let's, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you for the opportunity to come in your presence this morning and to hear the word of God. I pray, Father, that this word would invade our hearts, our minds, our spirits. Pray that the word would transform us, illuminate us, bring us closer to an understanding of who you are. We thank you so much, Father, and in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, take a seat. I'm personally studying the book of Mark and uh, going through each chapter. Each chapter, God gives me something that really stands out to me. One of the jobs of a shepherd is to feed you what has fed him. And so if it feeds me, I know it will feed you. Amen? And so in Mark chapter 1, we're going to go to verse 12. Amen? The word of God says, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Everybody say immediately. immediately. Again, it says immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered to him. Let me read that one more time. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. Early in chapter 1, we see that Jesus has been baptized in the Jordan River, and the Spirit of God comes down. And the, the Lord says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But by verse 12, the celebration for his baptism is over. By verse 12, the Holy Ghost is driving Jesus to go into the wilderness. Now I want you to see the, the, the two very vastly different scenes. One is the Spirit of God and the Father are at your baptism. And there is a recognition in the Jordan River of who you are. And then a few verses later, you are in the wilderness. In the wilderness, we know the desert is hot by day, but it is also very cold at night. And so I want you to consider the two vastly different scenarios that Jesus was in. And it's very, very interesting because it was not a circumstance. It was not a friend. It was not a family member. It was not a betrayal that put him in the wilderness. It was God. There are some deserts. There are some wilderness experiences that God himself will put you in and you won't be able to run from it. And one of the things that I notice with a lot of Christians is we're always complaining about our current circumstance and where we're at. Oh man, it's so tough being lonely. It's so tough being single. It's so tough nobody appreciates me. It's so tough nobody recognizes me. But what you don't understand is that you have to go through a season of being by yourself. You have to go through a season of wilderness. You might even be married. Let me explain something to you. Just because you're married does not mean that you won't go into the wilderness. There'll be a time where God will say, you're going in here, your husband's not going with you, and that's the end of it. You're going to pray at 430. I'm not asking you and your husband. I said to you, stop trying to put on him what I asked you to do. Your office, your call, your anointing ain't got nothing to do with your spouse. It's a personal thing. And we have to be very careful in putting our convictions on other people. Because what is of the Holy Ghost is of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost communicates to me, I don't answer to nobody. When the Holy Ghost communicates to you, you don't question it and you don't go, Mommy, should I do this? Dad, should I? No. You obey the Holy Ghost. There are going to be moments in your life, wake up, 
where God is going to say, I want you to fast for 21 days. I want you to fast for 30 days. I want you to fast for 40 days. I want you to give up television for a month. I want you to give up social media for a week. There are going to be moments where God speaks to you, and you better listen when God speaks because your elevation is dependent on your obedience to the instruction that God gives you. Jesus does not get out of the wilderness without obedience. I'm quiet this morning. No amen. No claps. No, you don't need to clap. No. If it ain't coming from you. Why? Because you ain't doing it for me. The word is meant to speak to you. Not me. I'm at home getting the word. This thing is for you. It's for your spiritual nourishment. I hate it when, when we're as a church and we're so shy about clapping. Clap if you want to clap. Shout if you want to shout. Say amen if you want to say amen. If it speaks to you, you don't wait until you get at least three amens and then you join in. Which will embarrass amen. If something is speaking to you, you shout amen. Simple as that. It's interesting because some battles... We are constantly blaming the devil for. Man, the devil's been attacking me. Man, the devil's put me in this battle. Hold on. There are certain battles God puts you in. And you can't rebuke God. Just so you know. You cannot fast against God. You cannot pray against God. You can't even sow a seed against God. If God says it's time for you to do this, it's time, I'm taking her away from you. I'm taking him away from you. I'm taking the job away from you. I'm taking the career away from you because you're not paying attention. And I'm trying to get your attention because there's something that's supposed to be coming up. And if you don't catch attention real quick, you are going to miss your destiny. Hear me. There's one thing that every Christian needs to know. You are replaceable. And don't you ever forget it. The sooner that you realize that you are replaceable is the sooner that you'll cherish every instruction that God gives you. Amen. If you constantly live with this in the back of your mind, there's no one like me. I'm the only one God speaks to. God only has a plan for me. God, he, he cherishes my prayers above everyone else's. You are going to learn real quick. You are going to get humble real fast. And you are not going to get elevated anytime soon. If you are at the same level that you were last year, something is wrong. And there is an instruction that you have failed to, to heed to. Now that's real talk. Because you should not be where you were last year spiritually. Come on, preach. Some of you have been with the Lord for seven, eight, nine, ten years, three years, two, and you still don't know your Bible. And it's not that God doesn't have great things for you. It's that if he puts you in front of a stage right now, you would embarrass yourself. Hear me, we have to understand that we have to go through process. So some battles that we are constantly blaming the devil for are actually God ordained. These battles are ordained by God for purposes of testing and character formation. I'm going to say this again. It's for testing and character formation. You need character above charisma. Preach. Charisma deals with the anointing. One of the words for the anointing and for gifts is charisma in the Greek. You absolutely need to have character to sustain the anointing in the long run. Because there are people that are so anointed, but they don't have character. Preach. And then their character ends up being the downfall of who they are in God. And so if you're so focused on just getting to the top of the mountain... And you're not worried about the lessons at the bottom of the mountain. You will not be at the top very long. Yeah. I'm preaching. Preach. Come on. So there are purposes within the battle to form your character. Everybody say, God form my character. God form my character. God will not elevate those whom he does not trust. Mm. That's good. To whomever much is given, much will be required. The requirement for those who have more is greater than those who have less. 
So God expects that he can trust you. Before Jesus ever gets anointed, hear me, before Jesus ever walks out the promises and the power of God over his life, it wasn't enough that he was just the son of God. See, Malachi says, you need to understand, Malachi says that the son of God will arise with healing in his wings. It was a prophecy that when the Messiah came, healing will go forth from his wings. Do you happen to know what his wings are? The prayer shawl that Jewish people wear, at the bottom of them, you see what looks like strings, correct? Those strings are actually usually it's 12 pieces of string for each knot or something of that nature, and it represents the law of God. I can go deep into this, but I, I'm not, you, you're not ready. Okay? And each one, that it represents the law of God. And it's called wings. The woman with the issue of the blood that touched the hem of his garment, the reason that she touched the hem of his garment was because she actually understood the prophetic word re re regarding who he was. The Bible said that healing will arise from his wings. And she knew if, that's why she said within herself, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. She understood that prophecy revealed his identity. Amen. You're not hearing what I'm saying. Go deeper, come on. But Jesus understood. It's not enough to have promises hanging over my head. The Father is not looking at me saying, you're my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and go heal the sick. No. You're my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Get up, go into the desert. It's time to get tested. Because, son, your ministry won't start until you've gone through a process. Ah, right, come, come on. It does not matter. Oh, my, 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 wake up. It does not matter what promises you've been given. Wake up, church. You might get a thousand prophecies in one month. If you don't learn how to obey God, Preach. those prophecies will die, and so will you. Preach. Amen. When you get the prophetic word, I'm going to tell you something because we don't understand why God releases the prophetic. Mm. Most of the time, God will release a prophetic word because he knows that the, that the attack is coming soon. Mm. Ah. And if he doesn't give it to you, wow. you'll lose sight of what's really going on and you won't be able to fight through the upcoming season. Wow. And so what God will do is he'll let you know this is on the other side. He mm. won't even say that specifically. He'll just say, I want to use you for this. And then when a battle ensues, you'll have to rely upon that word to get you to the other side. You better preach. Come on. That's why Paul said to Timothy, fight a good fight with the prophecies that have been laid upon you. Okay. Prophecy and knocks and enables you to fight warfare fights. Amen. You're not hearing what I'm saying? Go deeper. See, let me give you an example of how you can get a prophetic word and still end up failing. The Bible says that Satan has been, a, he's, he's a cast out angel. He's cast out from heaven and he will be cast down eventually to the lake of fire. So essentially we are dealing with a defeated enemy. Mm. Yet that defeated enemy will drag billions with him to hell. Come on. Hold on. Millions and billions from the church. Wow. Ah. Don't get confused. Misery loves company. Ah, come on. Better go there. Come on. Let me give you an example of the mafia. When mafia people knew that they were in trouble, most of the time they would rat on one another. Why? Sometimes they thought that they were going to get an easier deal if they ratted, but misery loves company. If I'm going down, you're going down with me. The mentality of Lucifer is, if I'm going down, they are going down with me. And even though there are many Christians who know that the war has already been won, they're still losing in the battle. Mm. It's not enough for you to know the promises. You have to use the promises to help you to fight. And so many Christians lose sight of the big thing. <clears throat> the big thing because they don't know 
how to fight the good fight of faith. Listen to this. There are three things that God is looking for in the trenches. There are three things he's looking for when the fight and the war ensues. There's three things he's looking for when you're in the wilderness season. What are those three things? Number one, do you have character needed for an upcoming assignment? Do you have the character needed for an upcoming assignment? If not, into the wilderness you go. Number two, do you depend on God through your trials or do you depend on self? Many of you, God has allowed you to go into the wilderness because he's simply allowing and wants to break you. There's no question about it. It's not up in the air. God wants you broken. Pastor Steve Gray of World Revival Church in Kansas City, Missouri, preached a sermon titled, I'm broken and don't fix me. Wow. It's a good sermon. You know why? Because the Bible says that a broken and a contrite heart, God will not refuse. God wants you in a place of brokenness. The problem with so many of us is we want to be made whole. Listen, yes, we want to be made whole when it comes to being unhealthy. We want our physical body to be made whole. But when it comes to broken and contract heart, hearts and spirits, we want to be broken. Because it is from the place of breaking that the oil comes forth. Come on. It is from the place of breaking that the tears flow. It is from the place of breaking that God answers you. One of the reasons that God can't answer people is you're, you're too prideful. You're too arrogant. And if God were to talk to you now, it would simply add to your pride. Ah, Jesus. Wow. Some of you need to be quiet and stop. Why haven't you talked to me in a month? Why haven't you talked to me in a week? Maybe you need to get on your face and just worship him. Some of us are more addicted to the voice of God than we are in God himself. That's a dangerous place to be. Let me explain this to you because some of you need to understand if you're a prophet, if you're a seer, if you're prophetic in nature, you don't do anything to turn your gift on. Come on. You do nothing. Let me wake you up. A doctor is a doctor. They don't try to be a doctor. A mechanic is a mechanic. They don't try to be a mechanic. I'm a preacher, and I don't try to be a preacher. I just preach. So don't sit back in your chair and think you're something special when you hear the voice of God. That don't make you special. What it means is you were pre-programmed before the world began to have a certain frequency in your earlobe to hear the voice of God. It don't mean you're special. There's a problem in the church, especially in this nation, in the prophetic move of God. That so many people are using the prophetic to justify where they are at in their walk with God. It means nothing. I can line up a row of preachers and they will all admit. And I got some on Facebook because I've had conversations with them. I'm not making this up before God. I've had conversations with them that will admit and they have admitted. One specifically had already admitted to me. He said, I was healing the sick while I was in sin. He's not saying he's in sin anymore. He was being honest about the fact that the gifts and calling are without repentance. God does not necessarily need you to be holy so that God can use you because it's not about you. It's the same thing. You could be prophesying and be doing all kinds of dirt. So prophecy don't excuse you from the holiness of God. Healing the sick does not excuse you. Casting out devils does not excuse you. It is a whole lot of us who can admit that there have been one or two times in our walk with God where God was still using us and you know darn well you weren't right with God. Jesus. Now that should put the fear of God in you. Because there was somebody else who Jesus saw was doing his dirt and never said a word, and that was Judas. Mm. And we know what happened to him. So just because Jesus stays quiet does not mean that you've been approved by God. Mm. Ah, come on. Yes. Say that again. Hello. Yeah. That does not mean you're approved by God. It means that God's allowing you to be used. Ah. <laughs> you are the one being used. You don't even understand what I just said. Yeah. You are the one being used. You're not using God. He's using you. Ah. And when he's done with you, 
dog. <laughs> and when he's done with you, you'll be an, uh, an honorable vessel that is thrown into the fire if you don't learn faithfulness. You can amaze the masses with your gift. Satan did it. And then you can be cast into hell. We don't like hearing it, but we need to go into the wilderness. Church, we need, as a church, to go back into the wilderness. Man. We need character formation. You know why some of us skip church all the time? You ain't got character, period. You don't have character. You don't have fixed fixed moments in your life. You don't have a fixed mentality on what is right and what is wrong. You know why we read the Bible one day and we skip it the next? Because there are not fixed morals in our life. We don't have a fixed standard. Well, I'm going to read it today. I'm not going to read it tomorrow. I'm guilty because there have been moments I've done that. And guess what? I feel guilty about it. And I feel convicted. And I'll go into the presence and say, Father, please forgive me for not seeking your face. Why? Because it's not a choice. It's an obligation that as a Christian you seek the face of God. If you are a Christian that chooses to seek the face of God when you want to, you are no Christian at all. Let me wake you up. Most of the time that I read the Bible, it is not because I want to read the Bible. Let's be honest here. I don't wake up and say, oh, I want to read the Bible. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't want to read the Bible. I'm being, I'm being real with y'all. I don't want to read the Bible. My flesh does not desire to read the Bible. The carnal man does not desire to read the Bible. But my spirit says, shut up, flesh. Mm. My spirit helps me to get in alignment with the word. And I know, although I don't feel hungry, catch this, although my flesh does not feel hungry, which it never will, for, for, for spiritual things, it still is malnourished. And it needs the word. I talked about this before, that one of the signs, telltale signs, that somebody is in terminal illness is that they lose their hunger. Some of us are terminally ill, and we have lost our spiritual hunger for things of God. When is the last time that you fasted? Hmm. Hold on. Not the church. Not the pastor told you. When is the last time that the Spirit of God laid it on your heart? By yourself, not your wife, or your husband, or your best friend, or somebody else. Would you fast? No. When is the last time God told you to fast? Well, God hasn't told me to fast. You ain't in his presence. God don't tell you to fast? What? You mean to tell me that you're more spiritual than everybody else? That you're already there? He don't tell you to fast. He don't tell you to put down the video games. He don't tell you to put down the social media. He never tells you that. You're telling me that God never tells you, get off of your Facebook? You're telling me that God never tells you, get off of your Netflix? What God are you serving? Because the one I know will tell me, and he's told me, get off social media. What is the last week I got off of social media for two days? Stay quiet. During those two days, it was amazing. Because Facebook distracts you. Some of you need to deactivate sometimes. You need to pull back and go deeper in the presence of God. Because there's a thousand and millions of things that are calling out from the world for your attention to distract you away from God. Some of y'all Instagrams need to be deactivated, period. You're prostituting, prostituting yourself for likes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And if you don't get at least 100 likes, you feel depressed. <laughs> Nobody commented. So 13 minutes later, you share the same photo. <laughs> you, you are insecure. I bother. I'm going to deal with this devil. You are jacked up. Nobody likes your photo in 13 minutes, so you post it again. I saw somebody do that this week. I said, what is this? I was about to comment, but I said, nope. Mm -mm. No, Satan, you ain't drawing me into this one. It's a trap. Number three, the third thing that God is looking for in the trenches of the battle, do 
You use your training when you're in the battle. You ain't getting excited about this because you're not people of war. Do you use your training? There's a reason why those in the military, Marines, Navy, Army, there's a reason why they go through basic training. Because there's going to come a time that if they're ever in the heat of the battle, they're going to need to go back to their moment of training to get them through. Mm. Some of you have a habit of relying upon what you think is right and what you think is wrong instead of the training that you receive. Your opinions do not override God's word. Amen. Amen. I know it's 2018, but the way to build a church right is still not with flashy lights, pizza, and watering down the word of God. You better preach that, Pastor. Listen, I, I know what the masses say, but I also know that the Bible warns us that the masses are end up going to hell. The Bible warns us that few there be that find this way. Jesus said, the way to destruction is broad and wide. Mm. He said, but the way to everlasting life is narrow and straight and few there be that find it. I, I get concerned when I see some of the congregations out here and I see some of the messages that Christians are listening to. And if you'll notice, there's a trendy thing going on, and it's all over social media with a lot of these preachers. And the trendy thing that's going on is the message is all about us. Yeah, come on. If you haven't paid attention, America is infected with the idol of us. The message is all about self-improvement. And it's not self-improvement holiness. It's self-improvement. I want a better life with more money and a bigger house and a nicer car. It has absolutely nothing to do with kingdom, nothing to do with the proclamation of the gospel. Pay very close attention to what you're seeing. And you will see all the messages are self-motivation messages. How you can live your better life today. The problem is that if you fall for that infection of the gospel, you will fall under the third category of what Jesus warned us about in Mark chapter 4. When he warned us about the parable of the soils. And he warned us about that there is a seed that springs up, but it has no root. And immediately Jesus translates it and says that, that this is the seed which has no root in itself. And Satan comes up. And he devours it. But what happens is that these people are offended when persecution comes as a result of the word. Or when problems come as a result of the word. In other words, uh, when they get persecuted for sharing their faith, they walk away. When they lose their friends because of their faith, they walk away. It's in your Bible. Everybody that calls on the name of the Lord ain't making it. And if you really go by the word. And it, if it's somehow a formula, right? Somehow a formula of the true success of the church. If you actually go through it, what it looks to me like is that one out of four actually make it into the kingdom out of the church. That means that 25% of the church make it in and the, 70, the, the rest of the 75% never make it. You might, want to be, you might want to be very, very careful with where the masses are going. Because if everybody wants to go over here, and then the message over here never deals with anything about your character, never deals with anything about your flaws, anything about holiness, you are in an infected church. We don't like to hear that. But we need to hear it. Go to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 16. And look what the Bible says about Jesus. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. Now, what this is, 
This is a prophetic word about Jesus knowing ahead of time to reject temptation. A lot of people never, ne ne never see this verse. Let me read it to you again. Read it with me. For before the child, read it, the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. The land you dread will be forsaken by both their kings. Jesus knew ahead of time. I have to choose. Not it's been pre-programmed. I have to choose. And one of the problems that we have is that we do not understand nor do we sympathize with the human nature of Jesus. We just assume because he's the son of God that it was easy for him. No! It was not easy for him. The Bible says though he was tempted in all points, in all ways, yet he was without sin. In order for you to be tempted, listen, that means that something has to appeal to the carnality of who you are. Let me give you an example, okay? Let's make some sense. Uh, Araldo is a straight heterosexual man. He has a wife and he has a baby. He is not in any way homosexual. You cannot tempt him with a man because there's nothing in his nature that desires a man. You're not catching what I'm saying. In order for you to be tempted, something has to be offered to your flesh that appeals to it. Something has to be offered to you that arouses excitement in your imagination or in the members of your body. It, it, it is not just, oh, let's go steal. Boom. It, it, if that has no desire in your heart, that's not temptation. You just say, get out of my face, you idiot. <laughs> but now, when you are on social media and you're seeing inappropriate things, and yet you have a past of inappropriateness, and you have a past where maybe you were a woman that didn't take care of herself, you didn't respect yourself, maybe you are a man that you did not respect your, 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 your body, and now all of a sudden you're seeing things that are inappropriate, now there is a drawing towards your flesh to go backwards. And where the spirit comes in is if you have the Holy Ghost and if you've been in the word and if you've been in prayer, then the word will begin to pull you back in. And you might, your eyes might look and your eyes might wonder and your heart might start pacing and you might start thinking, but if you've got the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will say, hey, come back over here. Come on. He'll throw his hook Amen. and he'll say, get over here. Amen. Yes, Lord. Oh, there's other moments that will come in your life when you will fail. And you will do something or you will do things that you don't want to do and you will compromise your holiness. But the Spirit of God will get you in that moment and tell you, you already messed up a little, but don't you dare go all the way. You better stop right now. Amen. Don't you listen to the devil tell you, now you already did this. You might as well just do what you got to do. No. You already walked into the bank. Your partner already stuck up the gun. You might as well finish the job. No, 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 no. Walk out. You'll still serve whatever you got, but walk out. Let, let it be seen that there was a sense of right and wrong in your heart. Don't listen to the enemy that says you jumped off the cliff. Just fall under. Call upon the name of the Lord. Because the Bible says that God will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able. But God will with the temptation make a way of escape. Do you know that? So when you make up that lie, well we're all human beings. That my friend is a lie. We all fail. That my friend is a lie. Because God promised that you would not be tempted with something that is new. Mm. You think you're the first person that's gotten tempted with something, something amazing? Some robbery, some murder, some sexual in your window. You think that you're the first person to have these things? No, you are not. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. 
You are not that special that Satan has took creative ability to create new sin for you. Uh. You are really not that. There's enough sin that he could throw at you to try to get you to fall under what has already been working for the last 6,000 years. He does not need something special for you. Hear me. Jesus knew ahead of time, according to Isaiah 7, 16, that he had to choose to refuse the evil. Now, you and I know what right and wrong is, right? Just like Jesus knew, what's the difference between me and you? We get real curious. And Jesus saw all those people ended up in hell, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the list is long, the Egyptians. He saw enough over his time to realize the danger of falling prey to sin. I mean, if there was anybody who you know would say no to sin, it was Jesus. Because as he was on the throne before he ever came to this earth, he saw firsthand what happened to Cain and Abel. He saw firsthand what happened to Adam. He saw firsthand what happened to Moses. He saw firsthand the consequences. So he was not going to fall for the same stuff that his, uh, his servants fell for. But yet in his humanity, he still had a choice. And it was still pulling him and he had to choose to say no. Why is that important for you to know that Jesus was tempted like any other man? Because the Bible says because he was tempted, he is able to succor. And that word succor means to help those who are also in weakness. That's encouraging. That I can go to God and say, Lord, man, it's been a rough day at the office, Lord. This person's trying to get me to take something that doesn't belong to me. I need your help. This woman is trying to seduce me. I need your help. This man is trying to seduce me. I need your help. Whatever your situation might be, you go to God and he says, okay, praise the Lord. I've been there. I can help you. I can aid you in the situation that you're going through because I've experienced these things. So when somebody says, God, he just don't understand. He understands. You're the one who don't understand. He knows full well how it feels to be pulled in by sin. But I want to show you, out of the word, how Jesus dealt with temptation. Because how he dealt with temptation is more important than just him denying it. Because if we just focus on Jesus denying the temptation, but we never actually go through the steps of how he was able to overcome it, we won't be able to get victory. So in Matthew chapter 4, I want you to go there. We're going to go to verse 1. And I want you to see it. And I want you to go to verse 1. Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus, read this with me, was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Hold up. Jesus was led to be tempted? Uh-oh. Let me read that again. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus was purposely put in position to be tempted. Next verse. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Next verse. Now, when the tempter came to him. So what you see is the Bible goes a before and an after. If you want to understand how it works chronologically, it tells us in verse 2, he fasted for 40 days, 40 nights, then it tells us he was hungry, and then it says, now the tempter came to him. So, what do we see? Verse 1, tempted by the devil, he fasted for 40 days, that gives us a detail of when this temptation happens, afterward he's hungry, and then it says, now when the tempter came. So what it's doing, it's going before, it's going, shows you before, after, and then before. Amen? It's showing you the different steps, the different things that happened. So it's going backwards now to show you what happened during these 40 days. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Notice that the first temptation that came at Jesus was prove who you are. The temptation was really not about take the stone and make it into bread. It was if you are who you say you are, prove your identity. Defend your identity. Demonstrate your authority. Show us a demonstration of who you are, Jesus. And if you'll notice that this is the same thing that he does to many Christians today. Prove to people that you're really a Christian. Prove to them that you really change. Prove to them that you really heal the sick. Prove to them that Jesus is really speaking through you. Prove yourself. You'll meet people to say, I, I, I think that stuff is fake. The miracles are fake. Praise God. Whatever. That's your business. I don't care. I've learned how to allow people to have their own opinions and I don't have to defend myself before them. But constantly, and when I was reading this this week, it stood out to me. I said, man, I used to fall for this trap all the time. Somebody would say, I think that, that preacher is fake. I think those miracles are fake. And I want to chime in and prove it and da-da-da. And it wasn't even so much for myself, but just to prove about God. And then through the scripture, it helped me to see, no, 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 that's incorrect. You don't defend yourself, your identity, or your authority. You let God talk about you. You just focus on loving God. Everybody in the world is not going to believe in you. Everybody in the world is not going to come and, 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 and say, yes, I believe in your ministry. I support your ministry. You just got to be happy that God has your support. Amen. If God has your back, why do you care about all the millions and billions or hundreds or tens or dozens of people that say they ain't got it? If God has your support, my friend, you are in the majority, not the minority. Mm. You can have five billion people supporting you. But if God don't support you, you are the minority, not the majority. You want God's support. And so Satan comes to him with a twofold temptation found in this verse. Defend your identity, demonstrate your authority. Everybody say, defend your identity. Defend your identity. Demonstrate your authority. Demonstrate your authority. Listen to this. We can't overlook Jesus' ability not to defend himself. I want you to see what it says here. Verse 4, but he answered and said. Notice, he says in verse 3, Satan said, if you are the son of God. In verse 3, what does Jesus answer? He does not say, I am the son of God. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Notice that Jesus never ever answered his questioning about Jesus' identity. Jesus did not make it about him. He made it about the temptation that Satan was throwing at him to convert a stone into bread. And Jesus did not argue with him. Jesus did one thing. Look at how simple this was. Jesus Quoting the scripture. We make this thing so difficult. If we would just learn to quote the scripture. But you can't quote scripture if you don't know scripture. That's why the Bible says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know why you're able to defend against temptation? Because you know his word. And not just because you know it psychologically. You know it because it has been engraved upon the stones of your heart. You know it and you can recite it by memory. I want you to notice that Jesus is 30 years old at this time. He's not 40. He's not 50. He's not 60. He's not Pentecostal. He's not Baptist and he's not Methodist. He's 30 and by 30, he knows the word of God. And by 30, he knew the word, not because he was the smartest guy. He did not ever get any formal education that we know of. The Pharisees made that clear. 
Jesus did not go to the rabbinic schools. He was not trained under Gamaliel like Saul. He was not trained under Sadducees and Pharisees. Jesus studied the Lord. All those years that you never hear about Jesus, those 30 years of a bunch of nothing, you know why there's a bunch of nothing there? Because it was meant to be nothing there but him spending time with God. There's nothing to write about. Because that was the time of process. We, some of us have a problem because we, we read the Bible and apparently from Genesis to Revelation it's not enough. And so we have to find out what was Jesus doing? Ages 1 through 30. Um, he was reading the Bible. He was studying. And he was working as a carpenter under his father Joseph. He had a job, praise the Lord. That's an example. He was a hard worker. Amen. And he studied the word. That's a good example to me. And by the time his ministry started, he knows how to deal with the devil. I mean, I, it's amazing to me because it doesn't say he stuttered. It doesn't say he kept on talking back and forth. He just, the word of God says, man, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth from God. I mean, that's, that's what he said. You and me do a whole lot more. Satan, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. Get out of my house. Get out of my car. Get out of my marriage. Get out of my, I mean, we do all this rebuke. Five, ten, fifteen minutes. Get out! Get out! Get out! I rebuke you! I rebuke you! I cancel your assignment! I cancel this! I cancel! I, I just feel like throwing this at some of y'all. Because you don't get it. You make it so hard. Preach the word. Tell the devil, it is written. Not, well, God gave me a prophecy and told me he's going to use me. Shut up. That might worry about no prophecy over you. Well, my pastor prayed for me. Whatever. You better take that and put it somewhere else. You need the word. Because you are not going to get out of the season without the word. Jesus, I, I, I'm not going to get past this. I, 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 I can't get past it because it is so simple. It is not difficult. It is so simple that a fifth grader can understand this. You tell a little child, if somebody comes and they grab you, scream. What do they do? How do I scream? <laughs> they go, ah, stranger. They scream. He gave you a simple instruction. Preach the word. You know why? Because it was the same word that kicked him out of heaven. He can't override the word. When the word is released, that's it. It's done. Preach. Speak. Release the word. You will never become much in God's kingdom if you don't do this. Okay, watch this. Let me give you some examples. Right? How many people want some examples? All right. You and your wife are having problems. You guys are arguing. She says, I don't want to go to church no more. I'm not going to serve God no more. Stop dealing with her, okay? Stop. Stop arguing with her for a second. Talk to the devil. It is written, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Get out of my house. That's it. Don't make it so complicated. Now, if you, if you have a little bit of faith, if your faith is so low that you think that that won't work, then I can't do anything to help you. If you think that you need a five to ten minute prayer, the only reason you need a five to ten minute prayer is because you have a little bit of faith. And so you think that it's like an engine and you got to warm it up. In the winter time, we all warm up our cars, right? <laughs> you don't have to warm up your faith. You just use it. You just... You're a man, you're a female, the enemy is tempting you with something of perversion, something sexual, 
What do you do? In the name of Jesus, Satan, I rebuke you. The word of the Lord tells me that sin shall not have dominion over me. That's it. And then you put your faith in what you said. You put your faith in that word and you walk away. You close that computer, sir, woman. You get out the house and you find something else to do. You speak and then you move on. And you trust that the word, because the word is living. Amen. He didn't catch it. Hebrews 4.12. The word is living. So you're not just saying something that has no effect. When you say it, it has an effect. You can't see it right away, but it has an effect. Everybody say the word has an effect. The word has an effect. You need to learn how to release the word. All right, let's continue. Pull up verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus did not focus on if you are the Son of God. Jesus focused on your quoting Scripture abusively. And you are grossly trying to tempt me. I'm going to respond to you with the word of the Lord. Not with opinion. Not with my authority. Not with my identity. With the word. You need to learn, church, how to hide behind the word. Amen? Amen. What else? Verse 6. Or excuse me, verse 7. Jesus said to him, it is written again. You should not tempt the Lord your God. Again, verse 8, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. This is good. Do you know that there's angelic assistance that's available to you when temptation comes? There's angelic assistance. How do I activate that? You pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I call on you to release your angel. Your ministering spirits unto the heirs of salvation. To help me in this situation. You call upon the name of the Lord. Look at this. In talking about this temptation, let's look a little deeper into what Satan was trying to get God to do. Not only was he trying to get Jesus to defend, okay, his identity and his authority, but the temptation itself was laced in pride. It's about you, Jesus. It's all about you. Prove yourself. Show your identity to the world. Let them know who you really are. What does the, uh, the, the, the book of Proverbs chapter 27 verse 2 say? Let another man praise you and not your own mouth. A stranger and not your own lips. You don't need to prove your identity to anybody. Your calling to anybody. Your office to anybody. Your anointing to anybody. If you've got to back up your own office and your own abilities and your own giftings, you are insecure and you should not be in the ministry. You're not ready. That's the truth. Amen. I wish somebody would have sat down and told me that. I've never, I've never been shy to say I should have never been in ministry as early as I got into it. There's no way 
I should have been in ministry, but I did not have the right people to sit down and talk to me and say, let's work on a couple things. And so I have to learn all these things on my own. And let me tell you, it's not fun having to learn it, but I'm talking to you so that you don't have to go through the same thing. The other thing I want you to see is that Satan is a master of identity crisis. We go back to the book of Genesis, and what does he say to eat? Eat this fruit. If you do it, you'll be like God. In other words, you're already not like God. But they were like God. They were created in God's image, made in his likeness, given power and authority. And Satan comes and says, hey, God don't want you to eat that because he knows that the day that you eat it, you'll be like him. <coughs> Satan is the master of identity crises. He messes up your mind. What am I really? Am I a boy? Am I a girl? Am I a he? Am I a she? Am I, am I a she, he, or a she, he, or a he, she, or it? <laughs> what am I? Do I like men? Do I like women? Do I like to dress in a dress? Do I like to dress in a suit? Who am I? Am I comfortable in my skin? Or do I want to be black? Or do I want to be white? Or do I want to be Jewish? You meet people all the time, they're not comfortable with who they are. They're always trying, that's why people get plastic surgery. My nose, my breast, my butt. Something's wrong with you. When's the last time that you looked in the mirror and asked God, how do you feel about me? Mm. I mean, you created me. How do you feel about me? What do you say about me? You gotta have some confidence. You might be overweight, doesn't matter. You're still made in the image of God. You might be a little skinny, doesn't matter. You're still made in the image of God. Everybody might not like your fat, but somebody will. Everybody might not like your skinny bones, but somebody will. God made you the way that you are. And let me, let me tell you, the Bible says you've been fearfully and wonderfully made. God did not make any accidents. Oh, I wish my eyelashes were longer. I wish I had blue eyes. Well, God didn't make you with blue eyes. So get over it. You don't need to go through therapy sessions to question why you weren't born with green eyes. I just don't understand. Why couldn't God make me with green eyes? There are people who are jacked up. I mean, the identity crisis, they don't know who they are. And let me say this to you. If you don't know who you are, you will go around hurting other people. That's the truth. It is not until you know who you are and you can walk in your shoes comfortably in the identity that God has for you, that's when you have confidence and you can walk with your head up. So it don't matter if you gain five pounds during Thanksgiving, you still, you know that you're good looking. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Amen? Doesn't matter if you lost a little weight, you know that you've been made in the image of God. Somebody else don't like you, that's fine. That's their loss. You don't need to change up your appearance if somebody likes you. You don't like me? Something's wrong with you. <laughs> your eyes need fixing. Simple as that. Don't be getting bitter and, oh, I need to go do some plaque. You know, there's a, there's a female who used to go to this church. You know, I'm, I'm going to say it. You might remember what, what we're talking about, Joel. We were sitting down and she made a very inappropriate comment at the dinner table at Ruby Tuesday. Look at Pablo, he turned around. He's about to walk out to the bathroom. He's like, I'm gonna get this. So a female, and I'm not, I'm not gonna repeat what she said because it's inappropriate. But she made a very inappropriate comment to me. And I just looked at her like, what is wrong with you? And next thing you know, months later, she had a little vacation time. And she went to get some areas of her body done. We'll leave it like that. And she thought, listen to this. She actually, I didn't know this until like a year later. 
until somebody brought her to me. She actually thought that by editing and changing the form of her body that she would get my attention. I, I had no clue. My, uh, my eyes were not on her at all. And you know, she would make little comments here and there. And I would always be like, hey man, stop playing, you know? She changed up the anatomy of her body. Now, now listen, to try to get someone's attention. Now, I, I want to say this to you because there are some of you that, and I'm not, I'm not knocking you if you desire to get enhancement of some type. You feel like you want liposuction, you lost some weight, you went to the gym, there's nothing wrong with that. That's healthy. There is something that is not healthy that I'm referring to right now. If you feel that you need to have bigger breasts and a bigger butt to get the attention of somebody, then you're going to have to keep those types of things going to keep their attention. Because that's not love. That is a dangerous road of identity crisis that you're walking down. Because you don't need to alter that aspect of yourself to get the approval and the attention of someone else. You simply say, listen, I, I, I really like this person. They don't like me. It's not the end of the world. There's 7 billion people. Right. If you don't like me, there's somebody else that will. That's it. Why would you cry over one person when there's 7 billion people? And, there's, and if you're a guy, there's way more women in the world than there are men. So it's not like you got to go to the other side. You know what I mean? There's, there's plenty of grass on this side, okay, for you to stay heterosexual. <laughs> Again, notice that with every temptation, Jesus never responds to the questions of his identity, but instead he responded with sharp rebuke, counteracting the temptation using scripture. Jesus did not argue. He quoted scripture. And he left it at that. There are three places that Jesus quoted for, quoted from, and I want you to see them. Amen? And they're all found in the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus quoted first from Deuteronomy 8.3. Jesus quoted second from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. And lastly, Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Think about this. This is amazing. To think about the privilege that you and I have. Look at this. Amen? Read this verse with me. So he humbled you allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone but by but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god do you see this hold up you have not understood something okay check this out you you're, you're not seeing it yet church you don't see value when i told you to read along with me nobody read along What you're not seeing, and the, the, there's, a, there's a tragedy here, what you're not seeing is that you have the privilege to read from the same place that Jesus read from. Hold on. That scripture has been there for like the last 4,000 years. And I just read from the book that Jesus read from. He, his eyes looked upon that same scripture. His eyes used that scripture to fight off the enemy. Don't you think that there's power in that scripture? If it worked for the Son of God, why wouldn't it work for you? Ding dong. Wake up. Go to Deuteronomy 6.16. Let's read it this time. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Boston. Jesus left out the mosque and it wasn't important. Because the concept is what he was using. Hold on. Jesus did not carry an Old Testament Bible with him. Jesus knew the word. It is written. It is written. It is written. Now, if I ask you what was written on somebody's Facebook, you know. If I ask you, what did your husband text you? What did your wife text you? You know. 
If I asked you, why did you guys get in an argument five weeks ago, for whatever reason, women, y'all know, I can't keep up with those types of things. Okay, I let it go. I try to remember why I was upset, and I can't. Because I forget. Okay? But women are really amazing. They have an incredible memory when it comes to things that have been done wrong to them. Guys were like, whatever, man. I'm going to watch football. You know, like our mind is somewhere else. Now, think about this. Women are incredible when it comes to their memory. How many men will attest to this? Any men? This, there's a couple. Oh my gosh. I just saw Diana. And she went like, put your hand down. I'm telling you, like the service. I'm telling you, I'm best. I'm saying in general, guys. Not. She has a good memory for the things wrong. Okay. How many of you would say that, how many men here would say, women in general have a pretty darn good memory for the most part? Maybe better than us, okay. Women, let me encourage you. If you would use that memory for the word, Amen. you would know the word more than us. <laughs> you really would. I mean, just pretend that Satan is beating you upside your head or something. And that he's telling you that word in the scripture. I don't know. Like it's, it, you, trauma just registers in your mind. Just pretend something bad is happening. And then you will remember this. I don't know what you have to do. But I'm telling you right now. It works. Would anybody in this church dare to say it doesn't work? I don't think anybody here would dare to say it doesn't work. So stop trying to come up with new age methods of overcoming temptation. It's 2018 and the word is still fresh. Amen. Oh, the bread is still fresh out of the oven. It's still quick, it's still living. It is not the manna that was good for the day in which it was given and bad the next day. This is the fresh bread that comes from heaven. It is still fresh. It's still right out of the oven. Every time you open your Bible, God releases fresh bread to you. How many of you like Subway? Anybody here like Subway? Italian herbs and cheese bread. Every time I open Deuteronomy, bam, get some Italian herbs and cheese. Some of y'all like flatbread? Open Matthew, bam, you get yourself some flatbread. <laughs> Whatever it is. But every time you open up the word of God, the oven still smells good, the bread is still fresh, and it still sustains you. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. This is, it's old. It doesn't work. You can't knock it if you haven't tried. This week, I'm praying that God actually allows you to be tempted. God, allow your people to be tempted this week. Because I want them to put this into good use. I want you to see that it works. Now, we just gave you three scriptures that Jesus used. Your scenario might be a little different. So Satan might not come to you and say, now, if you're really saved, do this. I don't think that's how he's dealing with you. He was dealing with Jesus in the area of identity because he knew if I can mess up his identity, I can, I can crush the whole plan that God has for him. The plan that God has for you is different. You're not dying on the cross and resurrecting on the third day. Therefore, how the enemy comes after you might not be dealing with your identity, but it might be dealing with something different. And so you're going to have to find scriptures that deal with that. If you are a prideful person, you are going to need to find scriptures that deal with pride. And whenever the enemy gets you in a position where you feel like you need to say something smart to somebody or defend yourself or be prideful to your friend or your family or whatever, you need to get that word ready like a sword. You need to cock that, that nine millimeter back and say, Satan, I got something for you. I got something for you. The next time you come at me with this foolishness, I'm going to release the word of God on you like, like George W. Bush did when he bombed Baghdad. The campaign was called shock and all. The next time you come at me, the next time you come at my family, the next time you come at our health, our finances, or our marriage, I am going to release an atomic bomb, an yes. intercontinental continental yes. ballistic missile, and it's going to be dropped, and it's going to release shock and all. You've got to have confidence that your prayers are moving mountains. Amen. Literally. Yes. Release a bomb, an atomic bomb in the spirit. Amen? 
And if you lack faith, you need, a, you need to get in fasting immediately. Fasting will cure your faith because it will starve your flesh. The reason you have no faith is because you're full of yourself. You're full of your flesh. If you'll learn how to conquer your flesh, you can begin to walk in your faith. Amen? Amen. Lastly, Hebrews 4.12, and we'll close it out with this. Amen? For the word of God, you should read it with me, is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's the Word. The Word does it all. Amen? Bow your heads. Close your eyes.